Hi everybody and welcome to Cooper Parry's Hub CP and it is really cool that you know after so long of zooming and there's nothing wrong with zooming it's still you know still great to be interviewing people by zoom but it's so nice to be actually now sitting with people and I'm <laughs> um, so excited to be sat today with Pip Murray who is the founder of Pip and Nut and thank you so much for a allowing us to meet you face to face and Pleasure. inviting us to um to your awesome office, which is in the heart of Shoreditch, mm -hmm. near Spitalfield Markets. That's right. Is that yeah, 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 just across the road, yeah. Yeah, I absolutely, absolutely love it. So, Pip, I... We call the office the nest, by the way. Is the see? nest, yeah, okay. Yeah, the nest, just so you know. What did I call it? Not HQ or something? <laughs> Sorry, whatever I called it is wrong, but it's the nest. But it's a really great place, right in the heart, obviously the thriving community, which is, which is Shoreditch. But the first question I have to ask is, where did this start? What was the catalyst for creating mm. this fantastic all natural nut butter business that you've created? Um, and just what was the driving kind of driving force behind all of a sudden creating these stunning products that we, we see here, which are in all major stockists, mm -hmm. flying off the shelves, the business is absolutely thriving, which is great, which we'll get to in a moment. But yeah, what was the what was Where the, what was the start? start? Yeah. Um, I, I very much came at it from a consumer perspective, so just to caveat, like when I started the business I didn't work in food and drink at all, I had no idea what FMCG even stood for as an acronym. I had Fast me in consumer goods, right? You got it, that's okay, it. Um, <laughs> honestly, no clue, no business bone in my body and I, was, I very much came at, at this business as a, from a consumer perspective, you know, I, I was someone that was shopping in supermarkets like anyone would, and I loved a product, uh, peanut butter obviously, and it was something that I was eating a lot of generally, because at the why? time I was why, doing... Why peanut butter? Well, I, was, I was doing lots of marathon running at the time. I still run now, um, still do marathons now, but at the time I was doing loads, I was a real keen runner, and for me, like nut butter or peanut butter has just been such a great, well, it's such a great product, it's both just totally delicious and addictive and great, but at the same time it has like protein, so it's always quite good if you're like post-run kind of fuel or, or pre-run fuel and post-run treat. So it was like my, it was my like spoon out of the jar treat after a run and, and for me like when I was shopping and trying to find products that I liked, like when I was shopping the fixture about eight years ago, like there were no brands that didn't contain palm oil, so everything was palm oil filled, which didn't agree with me as someone that's more sort of healthier and sort of eco-conscious. And nearly every single product was like incredibly processed, quite Americanized and I thought this just isn't a brand here that really resonates with me as a kind of more healthier, health led um, sort of lifestyle shopper and you know I think back then there was like lots of really cool brands like popping up all around the supermarket like ones that spring to mind are like proper corn or you know obviously Innocence the classic. Can you feature them on CP? They're a brilliant yeah, brand, great, I love great them, brand. Cassandra's great and yeah, just I remember just spotting some of these brands and thinking there isn't this equivalent in this category, and I love this product, and it's just not being done justice. So that's where it started. Really, I literally bought a blender, uh, which we actually still use now as product development now. But well, it's still here. It's still here. The so blender. It's still, wow, it's brilliant. Still working, and yeah, made them in my kitchen and tinkered around for quite a while, and took them to markets to try them out and. Yeah, that's that's really where it started. So it's a proper like kitchen table startup, and yeah, has since obviously gone on to do some amazing things. Now there's a question in my head which I got to ask, which mm. is, um, it's full throttle, obviously running a business, let yeah. alone a fast growth business. Mm. You say you're still running marathons. Yeah, I try and do one a year. That's like normally my ambition. Although last year I didn't manage to do it, so yeah, 2020 yeah. was a write off. But hopefully this year, or I'll, I'll well. Maybe 2022, I managed to squeeze one in. Wow, respect for that. That's, that, that's incredible. I yeah. mean, finding a time to do that as well as running the business, but um, that's incredible. So when the business, um, sorry, when you, you, you spoke about going to markets and what have you, I noticed on your website, you said not just hustle once, you said it three times, hustle, hustle, hustle. That's where you really learn how mm. to, to get the product out there. Was that a really important part of your kind of learning how to get the product out there in mm. terms of going to the marketplace, the markets and and selling your product, was that a good experience? Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of the most important things you can do if you're, particularly if you're like me who didn't have any kind of experience whatsoever, like it was such like confidence building as much as anything else, but also like back then I didn't really know what I was doing and I guess in reality what I was doing was consumer testing, like getting in front of people to get them to try a product, to give me feedback there and then live, face to face, 
and fundamentally also see whether or not people put their hand in their pocket and handed over some cash for the, for the brand, for the product. But I, I mean, I guess at that stage as well, as much as anything else, it's like the smallest thing you could do for the for as little man as po- uh, money as possible is just sort of get out the door and just start testing your idea. And I think it's just like critical in those early days that you don't just start to like spend loads of cash unnecessarily when actually you can do some really early stage kind of trialling and then start to jump in a little bit deeper into the water. So, yeah, I loved it. It was good fun as much as anything else. It gave me, like, a bit of a buzz, and it gave me probably that kick to be like, you know what, I want to keep going because I think that people really like these products, and I think the idea has legs. Um, So I I did that probably for about four or five months, so it wasn't that long, um, and I had some product I'd make in my kitchen. I'd pack it all up. I'd literally label every single jar, and every week I'd sell through all the products that I made. And wow. yeah, it was just like I mean, it was tiny, but it was those first step, steps, you know, in the right direction. And then start to think about how to scale it up, and that was like the next big challenge after that, which was. And wow. are, are people when they give you feedback? You know, you mm-hmm. said what was really uh, was was really good that kind of the minute you're looking people in the eye and asking yeah. for feedback. I guess there's no better feedback than in that moment when you're literally face to face with someone and. Was it always great feedback, or sometimes did people, you know, give you some sort of ideas and tips that were really helpful that you went back and, you know, refined back at the kitchen? What, what, what was that? Yeah, like? definitely. And, and as much as anything else, like the fact that you can see there and then, like what sells well as well, is like the, a really good indication anyway. Like what's the one that constantly sells out first? Sort of a good, good indication yes. that, that one's going to be popular. But yeah, and also I feel like people are brutally honest not always to your face but it's what they say like to their friend that, that they're standing next to they're like oh I didn't like that sort of so you're reaction so you yeah. Yeah, can notice and kind of pick up on things and look you know some things just don't appeal to certain people and you can accept there's always a bit of subjectivity in everything that everyone's saying yeah but if you get enough like positive feedback and again like we I used to get people come back week on week and pick up jars week on week so even at that really really early stage there was a sense of like I guess loyalty or, or you know people really loving what I was doing and actually willing to come back again and I remember the first time someone Instagrammed a product and again it was in our like kind of my early stage it didn't look quite like this back then but it still had the name Pippin Up but I remember they, I had an Instagram product page and the first person that kind of Instagrammed having Pippin Up for breakfast and I remember just that feeling just being amazing and just being like oh I, I just love That's my it. product. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. So, yeah. yeah, you do, you do, t- and I remember I tweaked those the recipes, changed some of the percentages of some of the flavours, and just generally I was eating a lot of it as well. So, at that stage, you could play around with it and refine your recipes and really get them to a stage that you're like happy with, and maybe decide one or two didn't work and just cut them. So, yeah, yeah really. You know, but I, I'm thinking, you know, when people say business, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's business, it's not personal, but mm-hmm. when you decide to put your name, onto a product yeah it's deeply personal isn't it yeah. I hadn't really thought about that you know when the fact your name is on your product this is yeah. <laughs> deeply deeply personal to you yeah no it is it's, it's a hundred percent my baby and I think yeah I, I, I think it helps us a lot along the way as well as much as anything else is that it's a very like human brand although Absolutely. it has a squirrel in it but it's yeah. you know <laughs> it has my name and I'm very like front and centre for a while I resisted it a little bit I didn't always want to be like the face of it but over time I think as I've grown in confidence as much as anything else I want people to know that like this is an independent brand made with so much love and attention and care and passion and so yeah I think the connection is really positive and hopefully as we grow we'll keep us grounded as much as anything else yeah so tell us about the moment when you had that first listing in a major supermarket because it's obviously mm. the first major milestone for any brand, any yeah. product is getting into that big well-known stockist. What was it What was it like for you? What process did you have to go to? But yeah, come back to that question. What was it like when you had the, the email or the nod or whatever it was saying, yes, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna roll you out in the store. What was the, what just, was the, what was the feeling? Yeah, like one of the highlight moments of, of this brand of growing it was that first listing because it is such, the, the validation that you need, like having that first initial kind of yes from a buyer that is from a major supermarket. Because up until that point, you're sort of building and you're, you're growing the business in independent channels or in some really lovely chains, but you don't necessarily have that like national scale yet, which is what a supermarket gets you. And yeah, I do remember really vividly, we were in our old office back in Hackney, which was like a horrible kind of warehouse that had no windows, that leaked all the time. 
Um, and yeah, I was with a team of like four of us at the time. It was a tiny business. And I remember the buyer just, it was very casual, which was also what I found mind blowing. Because for me, it was like the most amazing thing. But he just dropped me a quick email. I was like, I'll just let you know the listing's confirmed. You're going into 400 stores. We'll take four SKUs and you'll go in in about three months' time. So it was just like kind regards. Um, whereas, <laughs> in, and then I, I really did open it up and just, you know, you just lose. Your shit. It is what did you do? Amazing. What did you do? What was your reaction? I think I just, just like scream. screamed. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, and we definitely went down the pub. Uh, not celebrate. Pub, yeah, and had a few pints. Um, but yeah, it's just it. It was an amazing feeling and just exciting. But then suddenly, I remember actually quite vividly because I remember then start, like a, a day later, like doing the calculations of how much stock we needed to, to make to supply. And at the time, our supply chain was set up that we were having to buy quite a lot of stuff up front. So I remember it was this like elation and then it's like crash down really? to earth as we were like, yeah, we reality. pay for all of this, uh, which we figured out eventually. But yeah, it, it is like, yeah, nothing beats it actually, those first listings. It's like an adrenaline rush. It's, it's brilliant. So just for the sake of creating context for uh, the people watching this, you are in some household stockists from Sainsbury's, Morrison's, Asda, Holland and Barrett. I mean, they're, they're massive names. Mm. Um, when there is so much competition with with products, what what sort of tips can you give us in terms of how you can stand out and mm. really get that product noticed? What do you think you've done that has enabled you to do that? Mm. I think I think from the get go, um, did invest quite heavily in making sure that the brand itself. I mean, the product fundamentally has to taste better than. Yeah. So put that to one that's side. the number one and that's a given it's a given yeah. you can't get away with having anything less than the best then I think it comes down to the brand and really I think what's been our success is the fact that Pippin is such a distinctive brand like it, you know if you look at the identity it's quite playful it's got a squirrel that runs through it a lot of our tone of voice um, is very distinctive because we have this kind of squirrely language and all about foraging and nature and you know, it's very um, ownable and, and something that we can really create a kind of a moat around, if you like. Yeah. Um, and I think with that means that you can have a lot of fun when it comes to marketing. And I think, you know, we've done all sorts of different campaigns. In the earlier days, it was more gorilla, but more recently we've done like, you know, tube campaigns with giant squirrels, real life squirrels on the camp, on the tubes, on the posters. Real life squirrels. Like, <laughs> we shot real life squirrels in Norway and like, we put them on posters and uh, yeah, it was a brilliant wow. campaign and just, quite eye-catching, grabby and distinctive more than anything else. So I think just having a standout brand and really pop, like popping, you know, your packaging really pops on shelf. Like if you're going to invest anywhere, invest in your packaging, make sure it really is clear, but also unique and, and ownable. I think that's one place to start. And then I think the rest of it is, is really about, you know, invest at shelf and do everything you can to try and drive trial. So in the early days, we just sampled and sampled and sampled like crazy when we were like in the likes of Whole Foods, for example. And now, well, so, so sorry, just so you mean you'd, you'd have people in there just physically sampling the product okay, and getting yeah. to try. I think with food, like so much of it is about taste and, yeah. and building trust with people. So if you can start to like t get you to try your product, that's like your first barrier. If you can try it, people will often like convert. Um, and then now, I guess, as we're like a, a brand that's uh, bigger and in, in more stores, I think we, we use a lot of consumer validation and kind of testimonials to kind of vet, I guess, why, why we shout about being the best. Like, so do our consumers, and actually a lot of that, I think social sort of validation is so important. Yeah. So we do use a lot of that both in our campaigns or on social as much as anything else. It's to kind of give other, get other people to do the work for us and, and really... You know, in the early days, you'd, you'd just be word of mouth, but now we use that word of mouth and we amplify it across our, our marketing. So, yeah, I think a myriad of all those things, but but really just making sure you have a brand that you can really stretch and play with as much as you possibly can, which is, I think, what Pippa Nut is. Um, I bet that's quite scary, isn't it? You know, you're talking about really invest in the kind of the, the design, how the look, mm. the feel, etc. I guess at the beginning, like, you're talking considerable spend yeah. there. So you're really, you're taking a risk, but you're saying it's worth the risk because that's actually where the kind of, the kind of personality and yeah. essence of the brand really can start to, to formalise, right? So don't be scared to spend those, those pennies at the beginning. Yeah, and I know that everyone does it differently. And, and just my, my view is that it's, you know, a particularly consumer goods brand that is, 
you know, in that crowded space and store, like brand is where you're, is what you're building and it's where the value will sit. So invest there. Don't work with great creators. And I, I am a big believer that you, you pay for what you get often, where particularly when it comes to creative and, and really, you know, work with brilliant people that get your vision yeah. and can translate that into a really strong identity um, and, and tone of voice as much as anything yeah. else. So yeah, it, it, I remember it, it was one of the first big things that I paid for and it was eye-watering at the time. But actually, when I think about that one piece of investment, which, you know, tens of thousands at that point, which was huge, when I think about the cost of that over the time of the life of the brand, it's invaluable and, and it was such a good place to um, put, put yeah. those hard earned yeah. pounds into. Yeah. So turning to growth then, mm-hmm. um, you know, I arrived at Liverpool Street Station, you're, I don't know, I've just a few minutes just away now, so you were right in the hustle and bustle mm-hmm. of, of, uh, of London, you said you started happening, so obviously the business has really grown up now, lovely thriving office, I can see loads of, you know, desks and obviously you really have to scale the business up. What has been, what have been some of the most difficult aspects of growing? What have you, you know, mm-hmm. what have you found things that you would want people to kind of learn from what you've you know had to encounter with with growth i think i think sometimes do it but like when you're growing really fast you kind of want to do everything at once okay and there have definitely been times where we've tripped up and failed because we've just stretched ourselves too thinly and tried to do too many things uh, but not well enough um and i, I include some of like products in that we've had products that have failed, like we had a range of almond milks and it was just too much too soon and, and I actually ended up having to delist them all together because really? we couldn't support it, the products weren't good enough and actually just didn't didn't scale um, in the way that we'd hoped. So, so, so are you saying, that, so the almond milk, was that just completely going away from the core of actually yeah, why you started? Exactly and right. actually you know we're famous and well known for our nut butter, like we are the best brand best tasting products out there and we we drifted a bit too far away from where we started. Why? Why do you think that is? I think it's just because you see opportunities and you see if you've got a vision and kind of ideas and they're overflowing in that early stage perhaps when you're like just getting out the door you, you just need to focus on a handful of things yeah. and it's really easy to get distracted and get tempted to kind of you know go and focus on other bits but actually there's something really beautiful about doing a handful of things brilliantly well and just being like the peanut butter brand like that people know and love and and being really like single-minded about it so yeah whether, whether that's you know trying to like constrain yourself sometimes and say like you know what we we won't do plant-based that's not our brand we're all about nut butter and, and being okay with that and knowing that that will be done by someone else so and i think the second thing that i think is probably a big kind of learning over the last few years is it's just about how you scale your team as much as anything else. Like, make sure you get the right people in at the right stage. And I think there's a big thing sometimes in the earlier parts of your business where you feel like you need to get the experts and more experienced people in. And there's certainly a time and a place where you need to mature your team and mature the experience. But never forget about actually making sure you're, you're developing those kind of younger and often quite like kind of rawer talent within your company because, again, they bring so much fresh ideas and keep that culture that vibrancy within the business and I think that for me is always like it's, it's probably one of the main things I think about it's like how do we keep that kind of energy and sort of pace throughout the business that and and kind of that kind of hustle to use your word I love that word because um, I think it sums up what every startup yeah. has to really nail to grow it's so key and and as you get bigger like that has to retain and so how do you get the best people is, is high up on the list and, and make sure you're getting the right people at the right times is key. How have you found the fact that, you know, you said in Hackney it was four people and now I think you were saying earlier it's over 25 people mm-hmm. now. How have you found all of a sudden the family growing and as you say, talking about culture, really making sure that culture is flowing through the veins of, of what you've right. built? Yeah. I think sometimes it's a funny one actually as you, because I when I started the business I was 24 so I was really fresh faced hadn't really had much of a career if I'm honest it wasn't really established so I hadn't really learned how to be like a leader as such so learning to figure that out like what kind of leader I wanted to be and uh, what that even looked like was actually quite a big challenge for me and um, it's certainly probably still like quite a big growth area and like a sort of development area for me personally 
Um, and it's a funny one as much as anything else because you start to have to drop away things that you used to work on and love. So, I don't know, take for instance, in the early days I did everything from our supply chain to our social media. And then you start, you know, handing things off to people. And there are some things which are really hard to let go of and you have to because you just can't keep your hand, hands on everything. So that, that's quite a challenge, I think, as, a, as an individual, as a founder. Um, and I think, yeah, the culture piece... It's been funny, actually, the last year, I guess, with COVID, is what used yes. to be quite, like, organic and flow, and, you know, you're in a great area, a great office, you hire like-minded people, it's sort of the culture just breeds itself. But during COVID, it had to be much more kind of thought about and considered. And, and I think what I felt with culture, it's like, it's not even so much the perks, it's really how you treat people, that's, that's what kind of forms how people are in the business. How do you give people independence, general ownership over what they do, for want of a better word, freedom to fail and, and you know, give them good feedback as much as anything else. It's like some of the most valuable things I think you can do. And if you can create that, then you create an open culture, one that like everyone feels that they can come to work and still be themselves and contribute in a meaningful way. So that for me is like, if you get that, then you just, you will have a great, fun, thriving, exciting culture because people will feel that on a day-to-day basis when they're at work. Yeah, and going back to what you said about starting a business at 24, I mean, that's remarkable, isn't it? If you think about it, most people Very in their 20s, what, what we do is in their 20s, I certainly wasn't running a business. Uh, um, that's just, that is just, I mean, huge <laughs> congratulations for just having the courage to, to start mm. to start and do it and follow your dream. But confidence, how have you found that your leadership style has naturally evolved, especially as the business has got bigger? How have you found that you've been able to project that confidence Mm. Some people say they just learn how to fake it better. I don't know. <laughs> I don't yeah. know where you stand in that. But but. It's funny because like, I think I'm the complete opposite. And like some of the people that I like most respect are those that are like the most brutally honest about what's happening. And I think there's always a fine line to tread. You obviously don't want to, you know, freak people out and scare them off in the company and in, in your team by like being a bit too honest about how you're feeling. But at the same time, I think it's really great to be able to be really open. Like this is the sort of things I'm working on. I don't know much about this, do you? And, yeah. and have that kind of like authenticity, I think, is key. Yeah. And I think confidence is, is a one that does grow with your brand as well. So as you see your brand start to thrive and, you know, you get all this great feedback and suddenly you're in all these stores, like you get more confident in your ability to be able to deliver. And actually the fact that I think sometimes I often think I'm a bit of a, what's that saying, master of... Uh, Nothing, Jack, jack of all the trades. I'm definitely a jack of all the trades. <laughs> and so, yeah, I kind of think, actually, you kind of have to hold on to the fact that you were the person that actually had to get up and go to, like, get something out the door. And I'm certainly the person that knows the absolute most about this company and live and breathe it. So you bring so much value just from that and, and have confidence in that because, yeah, there are some very smart people in these boards and I'm very aware that I don't, know everything about supply chain or finance or marketing so yeah sometimes that can mean you have a bit of a wobble but you've just got to remember like yeah that you started it in the yeah. first place i'm always interested to um uncover or, or explore big problems that people have had to overcome the reason why is because i think when people look on the face of a successful business they think it's been just a bit of roses and you know good for you everything's just gone in the right direction and you know, aren't you a lucky one when actually there's so many highs and lows, so many crippling, brutal aspects of running a business mm. that uh, I think only when people are actually on their front line do they, they see how tough it is. But what are some of the biggest challenges or the biggest challenge that you've had to overcome? Maybe it's COVID, I don't know, but what is the biggest challenge you've had to come and how did you overcome it? Yeah, it's definitely been some hurdles. Um, I think probably the one that I, I reflect back on most as being the hardest period. I remember about... We were about a couple of years old as a business. We'd, we were in sort of Sainsbury's. We'd started to branch out into more kind of distribution. So really starting to gain some traction. And I remember it quite vividly because the night before um, I got this particular call, I was at this woman in business awards and I'd won an award that night. And I was like, great, I'm going to have a day off. You know, I didn't have many days off back then. So I was like, I'm going to take a day yeah, off. Yeah. I was, um, you know, just, you know, mooch, mooching around. I remember getting a, a call from one of my team saying that, 
um, the Food Standards Authority were coming over because uh, they were issuing a recall on one of our products. And it was one of those real heart and stomach kind of moments and very early stage business. Didn't have a lot of experience in what, what was entailed in a recall in, in the retail environment. And um, it was actually quite a big recall on one of our particular products. There was a fault with them that we were having to withdraw it from the market. And it was a bit of like an onion peeling. You know, you start to kind of realise it's quite a big issue in something that would cost quite a lot of money. And for a business when you're very early stage, obviously financial blows like that are sometimes unexpected, but also really seismically uh, challenging to overcome. And it was just a really difficult period of time of having to deal with buyers who were rightfully annoyed, deal with consumers who, you know, might be responding to recall notices in store, and just and generally having to panicking as a result of it. You mean? Yeah, yeah. just like having to kind of really dig deep and, and think about and and sort of fix the problem as well that was in hand. So I think. For me, it was probably the, the period of time that I found the most difficult because it felt it was like the, the most fragile the business felt at any, any time. And, but I guess the positive of it is that as a result, we built a much more robust supply chain. There were aspects of our supply chain that needed to be improved yep. and we ended up moving factory in the end. Um, and so our products in, I mean, the best place it's ever been since then. And, you know, learned a lot along the way about how... Um, I guess like how much resilience you can have as a as an individual and and so often now when I think about issues that come out of my way I'm actually quite relaxed about things because that genuinely was the worst, the worst yeah. period of the business and I think if you can get like through those sorts of moments especially things that are slightly more trivial that come later down the line you kind of it's a bit more water off the duck's back. Um, so the, that was the, the mental strain that must have given you mm. as you said the business was in that you know that period where it was. I, I guess wasn't as established certainly as it is now. Yeah. It, was, it was really on that kind of start to scale. Yeah. Yeah. Um, obviously, with mental health being such a a big topic, how did you cope? I, I bet that was horrible that night when all of a sudden yeah. the high of winning an award, looking forward to the day off, and then you get the news that there's a recall. How, what, how did you deal with that in terms of the strain that was to put on you? I think I think the main thing is that you speak to people about it, and I think that's often like I, I mean I think talking is is the best remedy i remember one of my investors and mentors at the time i, I called him up immediately because i was like what do i do and also help and i remember he was brilliant he was so supportive very kind and, and understanding but more than anything also kind of shared kind of some of his horror stories and yeah. i remember like suddenly feeling so much better being yeah. like okay i'm not a complete idiot and also this does happen and it's awful and you need to be responsible about it but you know, other people have gone through this as well. So I think that kind of feeling like at least like you've got other people by your side and having a network where you can like talk openly and honestly about how things are going, whether they're great or awful, um, is really helpful. Yeah. But yeah, I think mental health and sort of um, generally in, in business, but also for CEOs or founders, like where you're slightly more alone in lots of ways is um, something that I think needs a lot more attention generally. Yeah, thanks for sharing that because as you said, I think what's really great is when people do share that and you mm-hmm. realise that actually every business has their own horror story mm-hmm. and the businesses that become, you know, the, the great brands are those that have dealt with it and, and, and learned how to move on it and build something, as you said, even better and stronger and more robust in terms of all the systems mm-hmm. and processes in place. So mm-hmm. thanks for sharing that. That's a, that's a, a tough story, but great to see. Mm-hmm. But obviously great things have happened. And moving to B Corp Certified, it's something that I picked out on the, uh, on, on the website and obviously this is something... Uh, that a lot of businesses, sorry, a lot of businesses want to be a part of, but mm-hmm. so at, at the moment the club is, is still very relatively small and, and elite. But basically, businesses that balance purpose with profit, isn't it? Yeah. Why is it so important to you then getting that B, uh, B Corp certification and, and, and what was the process like? Um, I guess as much as anything else as a business, like when you, when you do that kind of like soul searching, like what kind of business do you want to grow and like have and look back on? Um, I wanted to make sure that the business I was creating really, really lived up to that standard of triple bottom line, people, planet and profit, and thinking about how do you leave the world a little bit better off from when you started, and to make sure that if you are a brand that makes stuff, that you're being responsible and cleaning up after yourself. And I think what I think is brilliant about having a brand, and um, it gives me that like fire in my belly, is the fact that you have a platform where maybe we're not the biggest brand, but you potentially have huge influence and reach to potentially also change other people's way of doing things or perspectives on stuff. And I think that's hugely powerful. And so B Corp brands, I think, 
obviously it cross cuts all sorts of areas of your business from environmental to some community led stuff to how you treat your people to the governance in your company and I think it is one of the best sort of stamps of approval that you can get that kind of validate that you're doing things better than what you know, the, the average business I think it's a stringent isn't it it's a really, really thorough stringent. process yeah. and I think so it's a, it's a you do a big sort of certification process a huge assessment and you have to get a score of 80 or out of 200 to be able to certify and obviously you want to get as high up towards that 200 as possible and on average the normal business will get between sort of 50 to 60 points on average so to get up to that 80 there are so many things you need to do to be able to iteratively improve to get there um, so it's an enormous amount of work but I think it's one of those things that like it, it sets this brilliant foundation for your company and keeps you honest as and great, for else. great you know you spoke earlier about the, um, the need to always recruit great people into, yeah. to, into a, a company that has an aspiration to be the you know to be at the very top of the game I mean you're nearly the top of the game aren't you I, I, I guess mm. you maybe you're there already I don't know but always needing to get the, the very best people I guess yeah. it helps as well yeah definitely I think number one thing that people ask us about is, is when they're sort of applying for our roles or say why they applied is because we're a B Corp so I think yeah. it means a lot to our team or almost I think it's more powerful from that perspective than Consumers still don't quite understand what it means yet, but they're getting there. So, in terms of the the future of the business, then you know whether we're looking at a picture here of a year or three years or five years, whatever to you right now is is that is that big next goal. What does the future of the business look like? Yeah, I mean we're doing like all of our planning at the moment. So yeah, very front of mind this sort of question. Um, but the, first, the, the, the three big things that we're working on so was, is innovation, so obviously nut butter is all, what, we're, what we're about, um, but obviously when you walk around the supermarket and scan the store, you can, you can see nut butter in every sort of different categories, whether that's in snacking or ice creams or baking, you know, there's all sorts of different areas that we could expand into, so we're starting to cherry pick our next kind of few that we're going to go into, so that's, that's a big one. Um, also, we're, we're at the moment, uh, just, uh, we're in just the UK, and um, we're looking at where's our next big bet if we're going to go anywhere else, so we're starting to think about our international plans. What do you reckon? Wow, well, that'll be telling. Top secret. Ah, okay. um, <laughs> and, and just generally shouting about the brand, we, we did our first TV campaign um, at the start of this year, which was just such a moment such a landmark moment for the brand did you know when it was going to be were you like ready yeah that? I yeah, was okay. ready I was sitting channel 4 glass of wine 9pm and there it was popped up and it is uh, it's one of the best prime feelings. time prime time it was channel 4 it was wicked and um, yeah and, so that, we, and your phone was going off the, the off uh, thing in like crazy yeah, yeah absolutely um, so yeah so now we're thinking about how do we continue on that journey how do we keep shouting about the brand as loud as possible and just make sure that people are aware of us because we're still growing and, and people still are discovering us so really making sure we're banging that marketing drum as loud as we can. I've just got to ask because you made me think about walking around the supermarket and uh, you know looking for the next the, the next product that you haven't seen before of, uh, mm. uh, of nut butter. Are you literally always on the lookout and do you, do, you, do you buy them and sample them? Always honestly I'm filling up the trolley you should see some of our samples in our covers in the office like yeah, it's a, it's a really hard part of the job. You know, someone's got to do it. <laughs> well, listen, thank you so much for allowing us to, to come to your awesome office and hear this great story. It's always so impressive to hear of businesses that have achieved so much, in, in, especially in your case, such a relatively short period of time that, you know, I hope it continues and, Thanks. you know, I urge everybody to go and buy these gorgeous products because they really are bloody lovely. <laughs> and thank you so much again for giving us your time. It's been lovely pleasure. to hear your story and can't wait to hear of all the future success. Thanks so much. Cheers.